see you later. United we play, United we win. It's his world and we're all just paying the rent. All hits all the time. We are family. Out to center, got it. We're busting ours to kick yours. Swing and a miss. On a 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfume. Oh my goodness! Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome into the Mass and All Access podcast. Amy Jennings here with Brendan Mortensen, Ooh. who's pinch hitting today for Bobby Blanco. Uh, Bobby heads home after the Nationals game against the Tigers today. Back to here. But here we have Brendan Mortensen. Yeah. How does double duty today? Yeah. So he just did the Orioles podcast. If any of you watch that or listen to that. And now he's in this neck of the woods. Yeah. How's it feel? Any different? Yeah, way different. I mean, my wardrobe is way different for starters, but if you listened to both the Mass and Orioles and the Mass and Nationals podcast today, I mean, thank you, but I'm also a little concerned with how invested in baseball you, you are, but also good for you. That's You great. might not work. Um, right. You might just sit at home, or maybe you're just so excited for baseball and you, you love this DMV area of teams. <laughs> you're maybe. just, uh, that's a very a uncommon fan though. So Somebody that would be so invested in both the Orioles and the Nationals. There I'd love to meet be, that guy, though. There might not be one single person that watched both. No. Maybe, my, well, if my mom knew that I was doing both oh, of these, maybe my mom well, would can watch you call both her of it. Yeah, I'll call and, her right now. Yeah. So Brendan had on his little Orioles polo. Now he's in his Nationals gear. Um, and we're going to talk some Nationals today. Yeah. Um, so we found out this week that Jamer Candelario is actually going to replace Vlad in the World Baseball Classic. Um, and so that opens up some reps at third base, which is really good for some young players like Jake Alou, who's rising onto the scene. Um, some, it gives some other, some other guys the opportunity to get reps at third base, but it would also be a really good opportunity for Carter Keeboom. And that's what we're going to talk about today is Carter Keeboom. He, he, um, had a setback in his comeback from Tommy John surgery. He was throwing from third base, but he wasn't playing third base in any games. He DH'd for the first time, made his spring training debut, and now he's experiencing a setback. It's his shoulder, which is good news, not his elbow where he had Tommy John surgery, but a setback nonetheless. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. He was ramping back up from Tommy John, as you mentioned, was getting some reps defensively at third base, but was only throwing sidearm. He was not cleared to throw overhand, which is a little strange, like mm -hmm. only getting cleared to throw from a particular arm slot, but was still fine to hit. And then it kind of seems like from the adjustments that he had to make to his throwing motion while he was recovering from Tommy John, he aggravated his shoulder because he was throwing from a different arm slot. He was just doing different things in spring training than he was used to. So aggravates the shoulder. He said that he could still hit and it was pretty much just all in the throwing. But Davey Martinez, as he was talking about that, kind of said like, yeah, we're not going to just have him hit and not throw. He's going to ramp back down. We're not going to push him. It's still a long-term timeline. Hope for Carter Keeboom. You don't want to have this elbow, shoulder injury, whatever it might be, continue to plague him over the next year or so where he can't find his footing at all. So rather play it slow with Carter Keeboom at this point. But as you mentioned, unfortunate that he could have taken a lot of the reps at third base that Jay McCandelario will now not be getting. But now it kind of hurts Carter Keeboom even more that it's going to be going to guys like Jake Alou. And it's interesting because, you know, Carter said the reason that he's kind of wants to slow it down or shut it down is because he doesn't want to, you know, change, you know, change his arm motion and put stress on somewhere else and uh, attempt to, you know, save his elbow. But it almost seems like that might be a big part of the issue here is that he's only throwing overhand. So, yeah, you're going to probably have some shoulder soreness right. if that's the only arm slot you're able to throw from. And he was a part of infield drills, didn't get in any games at third base. He wasn't there yet in his rehab, but you know, he's still doing drills, still throwing from third base. That's probably what's going to happen. Yeah, and it again, we don't want to speculate on exactly what might have caused the injury, but if your elbow is hurting so you're throwing completely differently, it just kind of seems like you're probably overcompensating somewhere else with throwing at a different arm slot with just more shoulder motion, whatever it might be, and he already couldn't throw overhand. Right. So 
I don't know, unfortunate for Carter Keyboom that he's not able to just continue this ramp up here. We're not able to see him get some more reps that he really needed in spring training. Yeah, exactly. So unfortunate for Carter Keyboom. And today we're going to kind of dive into what has gone on with Carter Keyboom, one guy who was once the Nationals' number one overall prospect into where we are here with kind of an uncertain future with the Nationals. So timeline on Carter, 28th overall pick back in 2016. His brother was already in the organization, Spencer Keeboom, who the Nationals took in the fifth round in 2012, I believe. Um, and then he moved up to the number one overall prospect once Juan Soto and Victor Robles graduated off that list. Um, you see him make his Nationals, League, Nationals minor league player of the year in 2018. You see him make his debut in 2019 when Trey Turner gets hurt, got reps at shortstop, didn't really work out super great there. He yeah. kind of, I mean, he had two home runs early in those those first 11 games. His first major league hit was a home run. Kind of bursted onto the scene a little bit. Um, just uh, four errors in the, that short time there. Gets moved back down. Then you see him again in 2020 can't hit same thing in 2021 and here we are with Carter Keeboom after missing all last season with Tommy John yeah and I think the natural question there is just kind of how did that happen at the big league level because if you want to take kind of a deeper dive into his minor league career and everything that we saw from Carter Keeboom throughout the Nationals minor league system as you mentioned he came in as a first round pick he entered the national system as a top five prospect and it was his bat in the minor leagues that was supposed to carry him up to the major leagues, and it carried him throughout the minor leagues. I mean, the guy was excellent throughout his minor league career. In 2018, he finished that year between high A and double A with an OPS over 800, and he was only 20 years old. In 2019, he goes to triple A in just his age 21 season and has an OPS over 900. And... Scouts around baseball took notice of Carter Kipo. He was one of the most highly touted prospects in baseball. Mm -hmm. Heading into the 2020 season, you could look at any outlet you wanted to. He was 21st, according to MLB Pipeline. He was 15th in all of baseball, according to Baseball America. And he was 11th in baseball, according to Baseball Prospectus. And again, for good reason. Because in just his age 21 season, he was absolutely mashing at AAA, he had an OPS over 900. The batting average was up over 300. On base percentage, up over 400. So when he made his debut in 2019, yeah, it's fine if he struggles in his first 11 games in the big leagues. Everybody's going to struggle in their first 11 games in the big leagues. The best prospects in baseball do that. So you're not worried about his 2019 season where he debuted at 21 years old and he didn't really show anything with the bat. But then you enter 2020 and 2021, mm -hmm. and Davey Martinez repeatedly said, you know, third base is pretty much Carter Keeboom's job to lose. It was thought initially when he was drafted that he would probably move off of shortstop, which he did. So the Nationals gave him every opportunity to win that third baseman job. And in 2020 and 2021, that was his spot. That was the time for Carter Keeboom to shine. And then he just kind of didn't. The bat just disappeared. The one unfortunate thing I think for Carter is that there was a lot of pressure on him going into that 2020 season. I mean, the Nationals lose Anthony Rendon after the 2019 season, and they move Carter Keeboom to third base, and they commit to it. Right. I mean, and how many times do we hear Mike Rosso say, that's Carter, Keeboom, that's, Carter Keeboom is the third baseman of the future. Right. Carter Keeboom is the third baseman of the future. Now it's a completely different story. But he said that over and over again. So he had to adjust on the fly at the major league level. It's not that they moved his, it's not a Brady House situation where he got all of that time to adjust to a new position in the minor leagues. He was in the spotlight. And then when you have defensive woes, you're going to struggle at the plate as well. So I'm sure right. there's something that goes into it. Still doesn't excuse what happened at the plate. Yeah, and it's just honestly really confusing because you look at, his minor league scouting report, you look at his scouting report when he was drafted, literally verbatim, <laughs> if you want to take his scouting report from MLB Pipeline when he was drafted, it said he had a knack for barreling the baseball. Yeah. And then you look at his stat cast page, and in 2020, Keeboom saw over 530 pitches and didn't barrel any of them. In 2021, he saw almost 900 pitches and he barreled six of them. So where did the bat-to-ball skills yeah. go? Where did the barrels go? 
it just really doesn't make sense for a guy to have so much success at such a young age at AAA and then come up to the majors. I understand the talent jump. I understand that going from AAA to the majors is a jump that a lot of players just can't make. We see a lot of players around baseball kind of get described as these quad A players where they're just somewhere in between AAA and the majors and they never really find their footing. That happens to some guys. It doesn't really happen to top 20 prospects in baseball. So the question is just where did the bat go? Just one extra base hit in 2020. Right. Got a little bit of his power back in 2021, but still not enough. And I think this is the one situation where we talk a lot about the Nationals' inability to develop talent, especially their you know first-round talent. Um, 28th overall pick here. I don't think you can say that with Carter Keboom because of how the success that he found in the minor leagues, that he was hitting in AAA, and it was just that jump to seeing major league pitching that didn't work for Carter. Right. But then you can't even really say that it was just the jump in major league pitching. There was clearly something else going on with Carter. Maybe it was a confidence hit after not really succeeding at the big league level, but he goes back to AAA Rochester in 2021 and... This is he's now two years older at this point after spending 2019 in AAA. We're now talking about 2021, where he's 23 years old, had struggled at the big league level. The Nationals needed him to go back to AAA, figure some things out. And from his 2019 season in AAA to his 2021 season, his batting average <laughs> drops about 40 points, his on base percentage drops about 40 points, and his OPS drops about 150 points. So he should have been mashing AAA in his age 23 season if he put up a 900-plus OPS when he was 21, but he just didn't. And one of the big things Davey Martinez did say when he got demoted and moved back down to AAA was that, you know, he didn't want to mess Carter up. He right. went through a huge slump, like a two-week slump, and he was like, I don't want to blow this kid's entire confidence. But oftentimes that does happen. And at this point, can you say it's a mental thing for Carter Keboom? I, maybe. I, I don't have another explanation as to where the bat kind of went for Carter Keboom. Because again, w as soon as you go into the numbers of what he was putting up in the minor leagues versus what happened at the majors, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the point where maybe his struggles defensively, you know, affected him at the plate, that would be a huge mental thing. But you look at 2020, that was really his best season defensively. He had four right. defensive run saves at third base, his first major league season at a new position. It went downhill from there. Minus eight defensive run saves in 2021. It, it just, his defense got worse. Right. And again, like you said, maybe it's a mental thing with, you know, he's focusing on the defense too much. He's not locked in at the plate, but the defense, as you mentioned, was pretty good before the 2021 season. And it's not like we're talking about a prospect like Jake Alou who puts right. up, you know, nothing against Jake Alou, but he is in the back end of the Nationals top 30 prospects. And he put up some great numbers in AAA last year. Awesome. The OPS was creeping up towards 900. Great. If Jake Alou doesn't succeed at the big league level, it's not going to be a major loss because right. Jake Alou was never thought of as a position of the future for the Washington Nationals. Jake Alou was never supposed to be a cornerstone piece kind of guy. And so despite the great AAA numbers for Jake Alou, if he doesn't succeed, it's kind of no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, if Jake Alou turns into a solid utility piece at the big league level, you'd count that as a big win. But this is not a Jake Alou type of prospect we're talking about when we talk about Carter Keboom. This is somebody who was thought of as one of the 20 best prospects in all of baseball. Yep. And if you want to equate him to a prospect that the Nationals currently have, I mean, we'd be talking about Robert Hassel just completely flaming out. I know Robert Hassel has dipped a little bit in prospect rankings at this point, but Robert Hassel last year was right around where Carter Keboom was in 2019, 2020, around the 2025th best prospect in all of baseball. The Nationals are counting on Robert Hassel. Victor Robles has yeah. not been what they've expected. They need an outfield piece. Robert Hassel is supposed to be that guy. That's the guy they thought they were trading for when they made the Juan Soto deal with the Padres. Yeah. And if Robert Hassel doesn't pan out at the big league level, I think you'd count that as a pretty big disappointment. You're hoping for a lot from that guy. 
And that's pretty much where Carter Keepum was. Yeah, two completely different stories. Jake Alou is the type of guy that, you know, rises through the ranks, comes onto the scene and surprises you. And right. it, it's a nice surprise. Carter Keeboom's the opposite where you need him to pan out. And, you know, you, you mentioned Victor Robles, kind of a, you know, a similar situation, a guy who was one of your top prospects, one of the top prospects in all of baseball and hasn't panned out at the major league level to what you would think they would be. But Victor Robles, can it, I mean, his future might not be the national center fielder, but he could be a fourth outfielder. Yeah, somewhere. he's a gold glover. Yeah, he he can be a fourth outfielder somewhere. He's going to have a major league career after the Washington Nationals if he goes somewhere else. Carter Keboom's major league career is at question because right. he hasn't found any, at least, you know, yeah, you can go back to the gold glove with Victor Robles. Maybe he doesn't hit, but he plays a solid center field. Carter Keboom hasn't given you anything solid to go off of. Yeah, in and, any part of his game. And not all of it is Carter Keeboom's fault. Again, he gets Tommy John surgery last year, misses the entire season. That's a really tough break for somebody trying to find his footing at the big league level. And he got a little bit better at the plate in 2021. The OPS creeped up over 600, which is yeah. not <laughs> great and not what you expected from Carter Keeboom. But an improvement. But at least you saw improvement. Yeah, the OPS jumped up to 619 from just a 556 in 2020. That's something to build on. And don't want to just, you know, completely blame Carter Keeboom here. He was getting better. He was improving at the plate. Then he has a really unfortunate injury that forces him to miss his entire age 24 season. But it also forces us to look at him differently. Mm -hmm. Because now Carter Keeboom is entering his age 25 season. And the path to a starting job should still theoretically be there. Jamer Candelario has come in on a relatively inexpensive deal. He's a vet who needs to have a bounce back year to keep that spot. Carter Keeboom should be able to take that spot away from Jamer Candelario at some point this year. Right. But I think there's a major question mark as to whether or not he is going to be able to do that. And that's why I think we're at the point where, you know, you go out, you get Jamer Candelario. I don't think any part of that was because Carter Keeboom was coming back from Tommy John surgery. I don't think, you know, even if Carter Keeboom is healthy, your plan is to have Carter Keeboom at third base on opening day, which I think Carter Keeboom's ship has sailed. I don't think he's any part. You're right. He should be a part yeah. of the question. You know, even after coming back from Tommy John surgery, there's still hopes that Carter Keeboom can eventually become at least, you know, an average major league player or a little below average but I don't think he's any part of the Nationals' plans at this point. Yeah, so let's talk about the current plans a little bit. We kind of went through his minor league career, talked about how we got here. When you look at the opening day roster, the Nats are going to carry 13 position players, yeah. which is you know the new rule, 26-man roster, 13 position players, 13 arms. Of those 13, you have nine starters. So Ruiz, Smith, Garcia, Abrams, Candelario, Dickerson, Robles, Thomas, Manessis. Those yeah. are your nine guys locked into the 26-man roster. I think you have two bench locks at this point. A backup catcher, whether that's Adams or Pineda, whoever wins that job, probably Riley Adams, but yeah. it, one of those guys is going to make the roster. And then Ildemaro Vargas played really well last year, gives you a great clubhouse presence. He can play pretty much every position that you need him to. I think those are two bench locks. So mm -hmm. now you're up to 11, which leaves two spots left on the Nationals bench. And... Among the group of guys that could potentially fill those two spots, I wrote down a few names. Alex Call, Stone Garrett, Carter Keeboom, Jake Alou, Jeter Downs, Matt Adams. And when you're breaking down that group, Alex Call has looked awesome. Yep. Four extra base hits in his first five spring training games. Not that you are putting a ton of stake in spring training numbers, but Alex Call has looked great. He was solid for you last year. I think Alex Call among this group has the best chance to make the team. And then you've got Jake Alou, who is hitting over 330 in his first seven spring training games. Not a ton of extra base hits, not a ton of power, not a ton of pop, but that's what you expect from Jake Alou. He can play second base, third base, or a corner outfield, and he's hitting over 330. Davey Martinez has said he has loved what he's seeing from Jeter Downs, who can play a very good defensive shortstop, so he could back up C.J. Abrams there. He could play second base. He can play outfield. Davey Martinez has even said he could play a quality center field if they needed him to. That's two outfielders, or excuse me, two infielders who might be above Carter Keeboom in the 
opening day roster pecking order at this point. Right. I mean, I think Jeter Downs probably has the most outside of a chance just because he's kind of in a similar, not the same situation as Carter Keboom, but he was once a top prospect, hasn't panned out exactly. Yeah, how, similar kind of guy. Similar kind of guy. So he probably has, I would say, the the smallest chance outside of these guys. But Jake Alou, I mean, I think he put out those impressive numbers in AAA. He hit 323 in AAA with – a 9.25 OPS. Yeah. Uh, he probably plays the best defensive third base out of those guys. Led the minors in defensive run staves at third base last season. You know, and then he's putting up these impressive numbers in spring training. It is what it is. But he's, I, you know, probably didn't, we wouldn't expect him to actually make the roster. You know, it was fun, added some competition. But I think now he's really giving himself a good chance to actually make the roster. Plus, you you mentioned the defensive versatility. Not all of these, not any of these other guys have as much versatility as, he's, as he does. Yeah, and why not, right? I mean, you have Ildemaro Vargas who can play any position you would need him to in the infield pretty much. But then wouldn't you kind of want to add somebody like Jake Alou who can yeah. play second base, third base, or a corner outfield? I know Stone Garrett has a chance to make this team as well as that second bench guy, but if Alex Call is your fourth outfielder, you don't necessarily need five when you have right. Joey Manessis who can play a corner outfield. And Jake Alou, if he's going to keep hitting 300 everywhere he goes, why would he not make this 26-man roster at this point? I know he's not giving you a ton of power, and maybe that's not what you're looking for off the bench. Maybe Davey Martinez mm -hmm. says, hey, I need somebody like Stone Garrett who can come in, be a right-handed power hitter if I need right. him to. But Jake Alou is going to give you quality at-bats. He's going to give you defense across the diamond. That's a lot of value. And he doesn't really need to prove you prove anything to you at AAA at this point. Like you mentioned, a 925 OPS in Rochester. If you send him back down to AAA and he just keeps doing that, What's the point of having Jake Alou there that much longer? Right, and it's not like, I mean, he did come onto the scene last year, but it's not like he didn't hit in in 2021 in double A and high A, you know? Yeah. It's not like this is just a blimp, and I think maybe you go into spring training and you make sure, you know, he's as legit as his numbers were in triple A, and I think you're seeing that it was. Plus, you add the solid defense on top of that, you like what you're getting out of Jake Alou. So we just ran through a bunch of potential bench options. And among <laughs> the two kind of toss-up spots, we've talked about Alex Call, Jake Alou, Jeter Downs. That's not even mentioning Matt Adams, who has looked pretty good at the plate. Where, does Carter Keboom fit on this 26-man roster right now, especially when you're not really going to see him for the rest of spring training here? I mean, we don't know exactly what the Nationals' plans are with Carter, with ramping him back up for spring training. But if you're not going to see him much, and Jake Alou keeps hitting 300, and Jeter Downs keeps making unbelievable right. plays defensively. I think if you're Davey Martinez, you're probably opting for Jake Alou or Jeter Downs on this roster at this right. point. And I think another concern for Carter is that, you know, he Tommy John surgery, for a position player, he should be healthy by now. Like, he should have been a full go at third base, I think, at this point, because he was a position player, not a pitcher, coming back from Tommy John surgery. Now he has this setback. You really have no idea when he's going to be a full go right. at this point. So why, you know, why would you give up one of those spots for a guy that you're unsure of, that you were unsure of before the injury, and now you certainly are? So at this point, neither of us really think he's making the opening day roster, right? There, I don't see a path that that could happen. So that means he's, what, got to go back to AAA yeah. as a 25-year-old former top 100 prospect at this point. Where do we really go from here with Carter Kipo? I mean, I think if... I think this could potentially be a good thing. He gets a year away from the big leagues due to injury. He's just kind of rehabbing, working his way back up. Maybe he just needs a hard reset. He's going to be 25 years old, hitting AAA Rochester... Maybe he can get back to the 21-year-old Carter Keboom that we saw absolutely mashing AAA competition. Maybe he's able to get his OPS back up. If he starts hitting again at AAA, he should have a path to the big leagues. Jamer Candelario, I don't think, is blocking Carter Keboom's path no. if Keboom is looking like the prospect that we thought he could be again this year. Jamer Candelario, again, as we mentioned, comes in on a pretty inexpensive deal. He's not awesome defensively at third base. I know he led 
the American League in doubles a few seasons ago, but we did not see those kinds of numbers right. from Candelario last year. So if Candelario is struggling and Carter Keboom plays well enough at AAA Rochester to warrant a promotion, there's still a chance here that Carter Keboom could be your third baseman. At third base, Carter Keboom has never been blocked. You right. know, he didn't move to third base until after Anthony Rendon was gone. In fact, they committed to him in 2020. He's never been blocked. It was always his position to lose since he made that move to third base. At shortstop, of course, he was blocked when Trey Turner was there. Um, but he's never been blocked. And I still don't think that's the case with Jamer Candelario. And what's even more concerning is that now you have Jake Alou's kind of rising on to the scene, a 26-year-old that could be your opening day third baseman in theory if Jamer Candelario wasn't there. Right. I think after the numbers he put up last year and what he's doing in spring training, and then you have a young Brady House. Now that's years off that they just moved to third base off of shortstop. So there are future plans at third base that I think Carter Keboom is no longer a part of. I think the mentality with Keboom just needs to shift. I, I think it probably already has shifted yeah. if you're a fan, but I think the mentality with him at the big league level is completely different at this point. Yeah. We mentioned that in 2020 and 2021, Mike Rizzo and Davey Martinez were both adamant about the fact that third base was Carter Keboom's spot. Mm -hmm. And we saw that. It's not the kind of thing where Carter Keboom struggled because he was playing here, playing there, couldn't really get into a rhythm, and he was used sporadically off the bench. That's not what happened. Carter Keboom started almost every game that he appeared in over those two seasons. That was his spot at third base, and he just didn't really get it done there. Yeah. And at this point, I think there's still a chance that Carter Keboom goes back down to AAA and shows something at the plate close to what we have seen from him in the past, and he gets a call back up to the big league level. But if he gets that call back up, he's not getting handed the keys to third base. Because if Jake Alou is hitting, if Jamer Candelario is hitting, Carter Keboom isn't just going to get handed that spot again. He is going to really need to bang down the door to be the Nationals' third baseman of the future. I think that possibility is still there. I just think it's it's... The window was really closed. Yeah. The unfortunate thing is they can't, Carter can't really use the excuse of A, getting called up too soon. I don't, that's not the case for him. Sometimes no. that happens with prospects. Because what else did you up, need to see from him? Right. Get called up too soon. Unless you use the argument that, you know, you get called up and put in the spotlight on a contending team. But his, his time in the big leagues was short in 2019 when he made his major league debut. And also, they didn't call him up they, like they've done with all of these infield prospects. Same thing with Luis Garcia. Um, even in now field, they didn't call these guys up until they knew they could play every day. Right. And the same thing for Carter Keboom, like you just said. Yeah, hey, he had 110 they, games at AAA. What else did you need to see? Right. They didn't call him up to ride the bench. You know, he came up and played. And that's the same thing when, when he got moved back down to AAA is that, you know, it was so that he could get, those, get out of this slump and get those everyday reps because that's the only way he could fix it. But you can't really use that excuse either. No. And the, the the script just completely flipped. Like you mentioned the power. You know, they said once he filled in, he would probably be an average power hitter. You never saw that come into form. He was super aggressive, probably had swing and miss tendencies. He had to iron those things out. You didn't see that. Sometimes he just looked lost at the plate. Um, so he kind of just completely flipped the script once he got to the major league level. Right. And I, I honestly think at this point, too, if you are sending him back down – to AAA Rochester, which I we are both kind of assuming is the plan at this point, does Carter Keboom need to figure out how to play more positions? Does he need to get more reps at second base right. at this point? I don't know if Carter Keboom is ever going to be able to play a quality defensive shortstop. That was kind of the book on him coming out. Yep. That was the plan, that Carter Keboom was probably going to move over to third base. But I think at this point, if you are calling Keboom back up to the majors he probably needs some more positional versatility than he currently has because this is not the same guy that you're just going to hand the keys to, as we've mentioned. He probably needs to learn how to play some more second base, maybe some first base as well. I mean, shoot, maybe even try him in a corner outfield like we're seeing the Nationals potentially doing with Jake Alou, with mm -hmm. Jeter Downs. I think he needs to become a more versatile defender because his offense has just flat out not been good enough to be an everyday starter at one particular position. I think he needs to play second, maybe first. Yeah, and whether that's with the Nationals or to give him a chance of playing at the Major League level with any team. Because right. if you're the Nationals right now, do you just 
call this number one pick a, a wash? I mean, it's not like they had any potential to trade him after what he's done. You know, if you're in the Nationals position, I mean, that's a tough spot to be in. And yeah. it just fills their their story on another first-round pick that didn't pan out. Right. And uh, you still have a lot of team control for Carter Keboom. Right. He's not arbitration eligible yet. He's not going to hit free agency for a while. But, you know, we, we've talked about kind of how we got here, what it looks like for this year. But down the line, you, you kind of mentioned it briefly. I mean, Brady House is coming. Right. I mean, Brady House was a higher first round pick than Carter Keboom and hopefully is going to be your third baseman of the future. That's what you're hoping for from Brady House. The Nationals have already made the transition for House. He was drafted as a shortstop, now moves over to the hot corner because that's just kind of what we thought Brady House would do. He's a really big kid, probably profiles as a power hitter, has maybe 20 plus homer potential at right. the big league level. Brady House is coming. I mean, mm -hmm. two, three years down the line, Brady House could be your third baseman. So this was, and maybe continues to be, this year at least, the window for Carter Keboom to take that job. And every year that goes by is just another year where you say, okay, maybe it's somebody else's job for the future. And that's why spring training this year was going to be so important for Carter Keboom because he needed to prove himself both as a player and that he could make improvements, but also that he was healthy. And now he's facing this setback. We don't know when we're going to see Carter keep, keep him again, especially making starts at third base. I mean, he has to be able to start at third base uh, to have a shot at making this opening day roster. And that's what the unfortunate thing is, is that, you know, he's not having a good spring training and he's having this big setback. Right. And there are still some things to point to in terms of encouragement with Carter Keboom, I guess. I mean, as yeah. he went throughout his career at the big league level, at least, you know, in 2021, he struck out 62 ga times in 62 games, which isn't terrible if you're going to profile as a third baseman with a decent bit of power. I mean, you look at even his best season in AAA, he struck out 100 times in 109 right. games. So that's kind of on par with what we saw from Carter Keboom in the minor leagues, at least. His walk rate was decent. I mean, he has yeah. a career walk rate over 10% at the big league level. So the plate approach is at least still somewhat there from what we saw at the minor league level. It's really just the bat to ball that's vanished. Right, exactly. I mean, in 16 home runs in AAA, or no, excuse me, yeah, in... Um, Oh, no, excuse me. In 2019, like, right. he had the power. It's yeah. not that he wasn't hitting. He and should have profiled as right. a 15-home run kind of guy at the big league exactly. level. And they've done little things. Like, he had LASIK surgery between 2020 and 2021 because he said he just wasn't seeing the ball. They've done little things and little tweaks and made tweaks to his plate approach and his swing. He saw improvements in his swing across those two seasons, but nothing worked. Right. So this is where we are with Carter Keboom. I don't think he's a part of the Nationals' future plans. There's, I don't think there's any talks or you're hearing anybody across the organization still saying that Carter Keboom is the third baseman of the future, which is really un unfortunate because he was a first-round pick. Now, do you think that this fits into the narrative of the Nationals' inability to develop talent? Or no, because you did see that success in the minor league levels and it was just the jump to major league pitching. Uh, that's hard. Because we've seen some Nationals first-round picks just flat-out not develop yeah. in the minor leagues. And I think that is more of a problem of, yeah, why didn't this guy show anything in the minor leagues? Carter Keboom showed a lot in the minor leagues, which makes it all the more surprising that he was not successful when he got up to the big league level. But yeah, I think you still have to be a little bit concerned about it. I mean, this isn't a top 10 pick that we're right. talking about with Carter Keboom. This, he was drafted when the Nationals were, you know, in contending, the uh, yep. contending. They had a lot of sustained success. Carter Keboom was a back half of the first round pick. I believe he was, what, 20, 28. 28th yep. overall. So that's not a high first round pick. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're talking about Bryce Harper, Steven Strasburg, even Anthony Rendon. High first round picks that the Nationals didn't develop here. But you still have to be concerned especially when you're looking at, you know, the, the first round picks from the last few seasons, maybe if you want to throw Carter Keboom in that conversation, but Jackson Rutledge, we haven't seen much from, he was a first round pick again, granted a back end of the first round pick, but we haven't seen much from him. 
Cade Cavalli, on the flip side of that, has looked pretty good. He has shown a lot of promise throughout the minor leagues and has, you know, will hopefully be a part of the big league team this year. But Cade Cavalli can't be your only first round pick to show some success. And when you look at the Nationals minor league system right now, it's a lot of guys that they didn't draft in the top half of their top 30. Guys like James Wood, Robert mm -hmm. Hassel, Jarlon Susana, those are guys that are kind of leading the way over the next few he years here for the Nationals. You have to be pretty concerned if guys like Elijah Green and Brady House don't start working out, though. Right, and it's kind of now we're seeing, now that the Nationals are picking in the top half of the first round, it might the story might change. Right. Um, but they haven't had success in picking in the back half of the first round, and now we're kind of seeing maybe like the next – I don't know, next phase of players coming in and the Elijah Greens and the Brady Houses that were, you know, top first round picks. I think it's well, it's a lot easier to find talent and draft talent when you're picking that early on. And I think we're going to see a new phase that maybe hopefully these the Nationals will be able to develop these guys that are in the next phase over the next few years when they're drafting earlier. But I think there's a pretty solid case to be made here, Amy, with the first round picks or the Nationals top prospects kind of from that era of guy I'm using the term era very loosely because it's yeah. <laughs> just a few years but you had the Steven Strasburgs and the Bryce Harpers and Anthony Rendones they led the way as the Nationals top prospects to the team that had a lot of sustained success in the 2010s you can make a very solid argument that there should not have been such a drastic drop off without guys like Harper Strasburg Rendon you knew there would be a drop but Theoretically, if your top prospects in your system were working out, not just top prospects in your system, but some of the top prospects in baseball at that point, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have just been Juan Soto when those guys left. Well, Steven Strasburg didn't leave, just wasn't playing very right. much. It shouldn't have just been Juan Soto. He right. should have been supplemented by Victor Robles, who was the number two prospect in your system for a while, number one prospect in your mm -hmm. system for a while, by Carter Keboom who was kind of their number three for a little bit, turned into the number one prospect in your system. It shouldn't have just been Juan Soto. Victor Robles and Carter Keboom, who were thought of as some of the better prospects in baseball, should have been there along with Juan Soto to kind of become the new core of the team after Bryce Harper, after Anthony Rendon. But because they weren't, it leads to the very drastic drop-off record-wise mm -hmm. that we saw from the Nationals where you have to trade Juan Soto because he was kind of the only one of that core that ended up developing into a quality major league player. Yeah, and you can make the argument that the Nationals didn't have to develop the Bryce Harpers and the, the Steven Strasburg. Yeah, and Steven or Strasburg and Bryce Harper were maybe the two biggest slam dunks right. uh, in terms of a number one pick like in recent baseball history there was no development phase for any of those guys but then once the nationals you know then you're drafting at number 28 those are guys sh and you're taking high school players you're gonna there's gonna be a development play phase and right. there you know their player development staff hasn't been up to date or they had the the lowest amount of employees in their player development staff across the major leagues that's an issue when you're you're having to actually develop this talent and that's where you see the drop off and I think you know I point to him being a first round pick but I think it's probably more noteworthy that he was their number one prospect and right. of course there are prospects that are complete bust but very rarely do you see a guy who's the number one prospect in organization come up to the major leagues and just be able to not do anything you know at least they have like a Victor Robles where you know yeah. came up had one good season in 2019 kind of dropped off the defense was still there that that's kind of a more regular story if you're talking about busts and players but not like this no and again it not just the number one prospect in the national system this is Pre-2020, the number 21 prospect in baseball, oh, according baseball. to MLB Pipeline, number 15 in baseball, according to Baseball America, and number 11 in baseball, according to Baseball Prospectus. This isn't just your number one prospect in your system. Maybe it's a bad system. Maybe the number one prospect isn't that good. This is a top 20 prospect in baseball at this point that just didn't pan out, and part of it is injuries. Don't want to keep just slamming on Carter Keboom here. I understand yeah. that getting... Tommy John surgery in your age 24 season as you are trying to develop at the big league level, that is a huge detriment right. to his development, and that's not on Carter Keepum. That's yeah. just a really unfortunate time to have a season-ending injury and to now have to go into your age 25 season with a lot to prove while you're still trying to ramp up 
from that injury. That's a really tough spot for Carter Keboom to be in. But it shouldn't have gotten to this point in the first place. 2020 and 2021 should have been the years he locked down the spot. We should have been really missing Carter Keboom last year and his play at the big league level and been really excited for him to come back and reclaim that spot this year. But instead, we're talking about Jamer Candelario being your opening yeah. day third baseman and maybe Jake Alou and Jeter Downs end up taking that spot at third base. That's not even mentioning Ildemaro Vargas, who could get a lot of spots over there as well. There are a lot of people that Carter Keboom has to leap at this point. Yeah, and I mean, Carter Keboom missed significant time in his first minor league season back in 2017, was kind of, you know, really starting to come on, missed significant time with a hamstring injury, came back and was the Nationals minor league player of the year in 2018. So he's come back from injuries before. This is different. It's Tommy John surgery. And you're talking about the ma- having to come back at the major league level. Very different. But still, just such unfortunate time for Carter Keboom. And the future, I think, it is really up in question. Not only just his future with the Nationals, but to be a major league player. Well, I'll throw that question at you, Amy. The expectations for a while for Carter Keboom were this guy is going to be your third baseman of the future. We're hoping for big things from a top 20 prospect in all of baseball. Carter Keboom is not that anymore. What are your expectations for Carter Keboom this year, two years from now, three years from now? I mean, I think the hope is that he can at least turn into a major league player. Right. Somebody that can be, you know, a, a bench player, at least, you know, a backup infielder that will be, you know, uh, that's I mean, that's a bar to reach still, for Carter. It's still Keen a Boom. valuable player. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bar to reach for Carter Keen Boom at this point. Unfortunate because he was expected and promised to be the Nationals third baseman of the future, which is unfortunate. And he's only played in significant games in two seasons but still not what you want out of him. So I think if he can just turn into, you know, a, a quality bench player somewhere at some point, that'll be good for Carter Keboom. Yeah, I think that's my optimistic view for Keboom at this point is you go back down to AAA Rochester and you just kind of start from scratch. Mm-hmm. You figure out what was successful for you in 2019 at AAA, what got you to that 900 OPS. You don't need to necessarily get back to that point but if we see Carter Keboom go to AAA, have an OPS 800 or better, yeah. like that would be great for Carter Keboom. Go back down there, get some more positional versatility, like I mentioned, outside of third base, get some more reps at second base, maybe some at first. If you need to, maybe play some corner outfield yeah. as well. But I'm with you. I think if Carter Keboom turns into a solid bench utility option, for the Nationals over the next few years, you don't need him to be your third baseman of the future right right now because, I mean, ideally you would have liked it, but that's just not a realistic future for Carter Keboom at this point. If he turns into a solid utility piece who can play third base, he can play second base, hits 265 with an OPS around 750, hits 12 to 15 homers, maybe. Like I, I think yeah. that's... My optimistic view of Carter Keboom at this point. And then the good news for the Nationals is that they have some talent, you know, coming up through the minors at third base. Brady House, far away, but you have him there. You have Jake right. Alou, who's ready to to bust onto the scene, I think. You know, you're not as worried about Carter Keboom and this setback at this point in time. You're not worried about it, but, man, it just would have been Big nice picture. for Carter Keboom Big to be picture. your third baseman. Yeah. I, I know that you have Brady House and – he might be your third baseman of the future in two or three years. And you, you shouldn't have to bank on Jake Galou. No, and you shouldn't have to bank on Jake Galou, but man, it would have been nice yeah. for two or three years down the line to have Brady House be ready to come up to the big league level, and he's blocked by Carter Keebum. you got to figure out where to put Brady House. Maybe he's a first baseman. Maybe That's a great problem right. to have. And right now, when you're looking at the third base spot for the Nats, it could be some combination over the next few years of Jake Galou of Jeter Downs, of Carter Keboom, of free agents on short-term deals like Jamer Candelario, and you're just kind of waiting for Brady House yeah. at this point, and you're hoping Brady House pans out. I mean, he's he's already been struggling with some back injuries in the minor leagues. We haven't gotten to see him a ton. You're keeping <laughs> your fingers crossed on Brady House right. staying healthy because at this point, Carter Keboom is not the answer long-term at third. Yeah, so hopefully, I mean, Carter Keboom, I don't think the book is – necessarily closed yet well you a lot of team control left 
not old at this point. No, he's entering There's, his age 25 right, season. There's right. still his chance he could go back to AAA, figure some things out, turn into something at the big league level. So we'll see where Carter Keboom starts the season, where Carter Keboom ends the season, and, and kind of what happens there. The Nationals are in Lakeland today playing the Tigers, so uh, tune in to what's going on there. Bobby Blanco has you covered. Uh, Bobby Blanco will be back next week. Sad. Yeah, if I'm you getting tuned kicked in. off. Mom, who tuned in just to watch Brendan Mortensen <laughs> on this podcast. Um, but he's Brendan Morton, Bor- Morty on Twitter. That's me. Yeah. Say it. For Brendan Morty. Because Twitter, I can't speak. Um, I'm Amy Jennings News. Of course, follow the podcast on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you next time.